Can we all stand together on this beautiful day? Here, getting ready to praise the Lord, amen? To lift our voices to Him because He is worthy. Online family, wherever you're joining us from, God bless you. Encourage you to praise the Lord with us, wherever you are. Let's bring Him the glory that He's worthy of. And Lord, we just lift this time to you and we thank you for it. Would you get all the glory and all the honor and praise today? In Jesus' name we pray. We all said, church, amen. Let's sing together. Walls are coming down. Walls are coming down. Fear is coming down. Lies are coming down by the blood of the Lamb.
priest rewrote my story. I testify, my Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Of the Spirit, Son, and Father, our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story. I testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified.
sweet it is to trust in you, Lord Jesus. The rock of our salvation. There's honey in the rock, Lord. You are all we need. Everything you did is already enough. How sweet it is to trust in you, Lord. And we ask you, God, that you would, Lord, draw us closer to you today. Cause us to trust you more, Lord. And I know that you even use trials and hardships and pain at times in order to do that work. And so we know that you're in control and we say thank you for it all, Lord. Make us like our Savior. Do a work, Lord God, that only you can do today. In Jesus' name we pray. We all said, church. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord the glory, family? Amen. Happy Sunday. Church, you may have a seat. Hey, are any of the men that were here yesterday here right now? Yes. You woke up or your wives woke you up or your moms woke you up. <laughs> Praise God that we're here and yesterday was just amazing. And thank God for it. Thank God that we're back here this morning. Let's check out this morning's announcements. Let's see what's coming up. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. We're so happy to have you here with us, and we're excited to tell you about some of the great events that are happening soon. If you made the choice to call Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley your home church, you may have wondered how you can take the next step to get involved. Giving your time and talents in ministry is an incredible way to serve God and give you the opportunity to grow and build meaningful friendships. Whether you'd like to serve on Sunday, during the week, or even special events, there are many ways for you to get connected. Come out to the courtyard today after service for Connection Sunday and find out how you can become part of our Jesus People community. Our men's basketball season is back. This is a great way to get in some exercise and meet new friends. Games will be played on Saturday nights at the West Wind Gym in Ontario starting on February 18th. The cost is just $50 per player, ages 15 and up. Teams are filling fast, so register today and we'll see you on the court. The final meeting for everyone traveling to Israel with Pastor David is happening on Sunday, February 19th, right after second service. Representatives from Inspired Travels will be here to go over important details you'll need for the trip. So come prepared with your questions and we'll see you there. Our worship team is busy getting prepared for the Easter season. Our Easter services feature an extended time of worship with our choir and we're looking for new men and women to share their vocal gifts with the team. If you feel led to sing with our choir, this is the last day to sign up. Rehearsals will be on Monday evenings starting February 13th. You may have heard about our beginning guitar classes, but did you know we also teach beginning ukulele class? That's right. We'll be teaching the basics of ukulele to kids and adults who would like to serve in kids' worship. This eight-week class is happening on Sundays after second service, starting on March 5th. If you want to know more, stop by the kids' ministry office after service, and we'd love to get you started. Whether you're visiting for the first time or have made Chino Valley your home, we're blessed to have you with us. 
These announcements are just a few of the events, classes, and opportunities to get involved. There's so much more for you to be a part of. You can sign up for any of our events through our website at calvaryccv.org or by visiting the events tab on our church app. As we get ready for today's teachings, don't forget to place your cell phone on silent and help us limit distractions by staying seated until the service is over. Thank you for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you again this Wednesday for our midweek services. Have a blessed day. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Calvary Chapel Chino Valley. If this is your first time visiting, we want to say welcome, and God bless you. I want to welcome those who are joining us online and those who are in the overflow this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. As mentioned in the bulletin or in the video announcements that... We do have what's called Connection Sunday that's going on after services, after both services. And we have tables and booths set up from the different ministries that are being represented from our church. And, and it's going to be right out here by the gazebo. And as we know that our church is mostly ran by volunteers, which spends from the parking lot to the kids' ministry to the greeters to the ushers. And uh, we couldn't do that without you as our faithful servants. And so... Since we are a Jesus people community, we want to encourage everyone to get involved. And so you can stop by out there, in the, and if it's not raining, it looks like it's not raining. Uh, but if it's not raining, right out here in the, pad, in, the, in the quad right here, you'll see right next to the gazebo, you'll see the different tables with the different ministries that are represented. And if the Lord has put it on your heart that it's a time for you to serve, stop by and take a look and see where the Spirit may be drawing you. If it is raining, they'll go to the patio and they'll have the table set up there. And ministry representatives will be there to answer any questions that you would have uh, or want to speak to you with any concerns you may have. Uh, this evening, church family, we have what's called a Sunday night of prayer. And it's our monthly Sunday evening prayer as our church family corporately gets together and we pray for the, the needs of our church, the needs of our, our nation, the needs of the world. And uh, it's going to be held in the mini chapel this evening at 5.30. If you're not familiar with our campus, the mini chapel, if you walk out these doors towards the gazebo, exit the church, and you go to where our bookstore was at, that's what we call our mini chapel now. And you would just make a left, and you'll see it there. That's at 5.30, and it's a time for our church to come together and pray corporately uh, to worship and have an encouragement from the Word. So everyone is welcome to come out, come out and join in prayer. Uh, for all of us that serve here in ministry, uh, Pastor David and Marie invite us to what's called a Servant Saturday. That's going to be Saturday, February 25th, and it's going to be, again, in the mini chapel starting at 9 a.m., and it's a great opportunity for those who are serving in any capacity of our ministry to come here from our pastor's heart. We do a Q&A. Uh, I'll probably get fired, so come for that. Uh, and so I want to invite everyone who serves and it's been a while since we've had an opportunity to meet with our pastor to hear from his heart. So again, that's going to be Saturday, February 21st, 25th, and it's going to be in the mini chapel. I want to encourage all of you uh, that come on out uh, who serve in our church. You know, yesterday, as Jared mentioned, we had our men's Super Bowl breakfast. And as I'm sharing about this, we'll have some pictures that are, are going to be cute just to uh, roll. We had a great turnout last, uh, yesterday. It, uh, there was a lot of guys here. And uh, it was an amazing opportunity for all of us to get, to get together and hear from uh, Anthony Munoz, who is an 11-time Pro Bowler inducted into the Hall of Fame from the Cincinnati Bengals. And he's local. He's from our area. And it was a unique situation. And I'm going to get into that in a moment as we will, in a moment, segue into our worshiping with the receiving of our, of our tithes and offerings. But we had a great time. It was encouraging to see all the men get together and worship together and have breakfast together and to get in God's word. And it was amazing to sit here and hear all the guys worshiping the Lord. And, uh, and you guys, this place was packed yesterday. And I want to encourage you men to get involved with our men's ministry. We have a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but interesting, as now I want to segue into our time of receiving our tithes and offerings as we continue to worship the Lord. How do you respond in adversity? You know, a lot of us go through different forms of adversity, whether it's a relational, financial. I, I experienced one personally this last weekend. You know, we had our guest speaker scheduled to come on out, Anthony Munoz, and he was going to come and share and speak to all the men that were here for this breakfast, and we advertised, and we, we put out tickets. And on Thursday, my secretary and I, Dominique, received a message from Anthony saying that he is going to go in for emergency surgery. 
And I'm thinking, we just sold tickets, we just advertised that Anthony Munoz is going to come here. Now what are we going to do? So I went to my pastor and he says, it's on you. You figure it out. <laughs> He's really wanting me to get fired, right? And you guys, I was so bothered. And again, this adversity may not seem like a big deal. The reason why it was bothering me so much is that I didn't want our church in any way looking bad. We're advertising and advertising that our speaker's gonna be here and all of a sudden they come, just kidding, we're gonna show him on the screen. So what we did is we zoomed him in and it turned out to be a blessing. But what I learned in adversity is that we're to worship Jesus. You know what I've learned is that uh, what happened with this whole men's ministry thing yesterday, shame on me for not trusting the Lord. And, I, and I'm reminded of what it says in Isaiah 43, 2 and 3. It says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you, for I'm the Lord your God. And you know what? It worked out. The guys came. We had them set up on Zoom. And it was an amazing message. And it was just a great time. But what did I learn? That during adversity, we're to worship Jesus. During the time that we're going through difficult times, we, regardless of what it is, is that we worship Jesus because our worship turns into a weapon that we're able to fight off adversity. And we're able to come to Jesus and worship him in many ways. We worship him through the Bible study. We worship him through the, through, uh, the worshiping of songs and we worship the Lord through our giving. And it really encouraged me this morning that my focus needs to be more on Jesus than it needs to be on me, especially during adversity. And it taught me a good lesson. Why? Why did I just trust Jesus from the beginning? Because he always comes through. And so this morning as, amen. So this morning as we have the privilege of worshiping the Lord through our giving, there are quite a different ways that we're able to worship the Lord through our giving. For those that are watching online, there's a link in the, in the chat box for YouTube and Facebook. When you click on the link, it opens up a page to give. For those that are here this morning and brought your gifts or want to give electronically, we have a kiosk in the foyers along with agape boxes. But when we worship the Lord through, the, through our giving, we're worshiping him and saying, Lord, thank you for all the great things you have done with for me. So what I like to do is pray for the offering as we continue to worship the Lord and we'll have another song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of you, Lord. Many of us here this morning have or are facing adversity. Some of it's very difficult, Lord. Most of it, all of it's difficult. But to always remember that we to we're to worship you, to keep our eyes on you, Lord, because that, as the scripture says in Isaiah, that you will get us through it. So, Lord, may we continue to learn that we can keep our eyes on you to worship you through our giving, through our song, and through the word. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And Jesus, we lift up our pastor as he brings forth this portion of scripture this morning. May, may it be anointed, Lord, and that it would pierce our hearts and that our hearts would be transformed, that your name would be glorified and honored. Holy Spirit, move through this place. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Can we all stand together, church family? Good fire. 
boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross is spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip. Father, we just we we off, we offer you prayer. praise, Lord, and thanks for all that you do, for all that you're doing, and what you're about to do in our hearts as we go through your word. We ask that you would just be with us here in this place, those who are outside, those who are watching online. I pray that your word would be rightly divided, and that our hearts would be ready to receive this engrafted word that saves our souls, and that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we put into practice the things that you speak. Draw us to yourself, in Jesus' name, amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, God bless you. I'm glad you're here.
Let's open our Bibles to the book of, uh, of Mark. We're in chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 27 through 32. I thought that was John crying in the foyer <laughs> after being fired yesterday. Yeah, okay. Let's see now. We had a great time yesterday. You saw some of the pictures. The Lord really moved in a special way. I'll be honest with you. Uh, when John had called and said to me, or actually texted me, and then, then we spoke uh, and said that Anthony wasn't going to be able to to make it because of his uh, emergency operation. He had kidney stones. And uh, I understand that's a very, some of you perhaps have had it. I, thank God, haven't. But I've heard that it's, it's as close to a man giving birth as anything there is in terms of pain. The uh, stone that comes out, when it does come out, is razor sharp. And so it slices everything before it, it, it comes out of the body. And so that's a horrible, horrible pain and all. And so... So John had let me know that Anthony wasn't going to be here. And so, yeah, John's involved. Or he's over the men's ministry. And I said, well, you know, basically I was saying to him, I hope you have an idea. And, <laughs> but you know what? The Zoom thing worked. I, I was very surprised by that, frankly. But that just shows my age, you know. I know a lot of people are, you know, they do that often. They see things online and all. But you know what? The Lord bless. It was great. Anthony's message was very, very good. And uh, he's going to, uh, at least he said he's going to be with us in the near future, and we'll let everybody know. We'll have a breakfast and all for the men, and uh, it'll be a blessing. But anyway, it was really good yesterday. We were really, really blessed. And so on Monday night, we have young adult studies. We invite you, if you're 18 to 28 or so, to, to be part of that. And Tuesday morning, we have our men's uh, Bible study and breakfast at 6.30. And uh, this upcoming Wednesday night, we're beginning a study. I haven't done this particular book in a number of years. And we're going to go through the book of Romans, which is, uh, it's been called the Gospel of the Apostle Paul. And if you've never gone or haven't gone through the book of Romans recently, we're starting this Wednesday. I invite you to be part of it. We'll be going through the first 17 verses of chapter 1, and we'll be getting into that study and taking it to the end. It's 16 chapters. It's a great book. So, uh, so we invite you to be part of that. That's this upcoming Wednesday, beginning at 7 o'clock, with worship, and then we'll get into the Word. So with that said, let's get into the Word. We're in Mark chapter 15. I'll begin reading at verse 27. I'll read to verse 32 and give you our introduction and move into our study. Mark chapter 15, beginning at verse 27. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you who destroy the temple and build in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. So as we pick up in our study of, of Mark, Jesus has been taken from before the Roman governor, a man that was known by the name of Pontius Pilate. And he's been crucified. As we've seen, as we've gone through Mark's gospel, after a night of abuse and torture, Jesus was brought to a place called Calvary. He was weakened by the beatings and the scourging that he had endured. His body finally gave out. He could not bear the weight of the cross any longer. And so a man by the name of Simon from Cyrene was passing by. He saw what was happening. Now, as a Jew, he would have been in the city to celebrate Passover he was more than likely unable to find any accommodations in the city because it would have been crowded with pilgrims. And because of that, he would have had to find lodging in an adjacent village. Now, as he's walking, he hears the, the sound of angry soldiers. He sees the prisoner that they're, that they're escorting. It's probable that he would have slowed down his pace as he was passing by. 
He would have thought that Jesus was simply a criminal on his way to execution. Well, as this is all happening, as we saw, at that moment a soldier saw him, roughly ordered him to come. The soldier told him to help this prisoner bear that cross. Now, it would have been at this time that he was drawn to put his faith in Jesus because it was humiliating, as I mentioned to you last week, it was humiliating for a Jew to be forced to carry someone else's burden. But it was through this act that he came to faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to develop this in my introduction. It's just a thought, but it's interesting to me how the timing of this event was so precise. Had he passed by a minute earlier or even a minute later, that wouldn't have happened. Somebody else would have been forced to bear the cross with Jesus, but instead he was there at the precise moment. And being there at that moment, his life was changed. He was forced to help carry the cross with Jesus on Jesus' death march. It wasn't a decision that he volunteered for. It was something he was forced to do. And again, being forced to do something like this was humiliating for him. The Jewish people hated the fact that they were forced to do these kinds of things. Ordinarily, Simon would not have volunteered, but he had to. So it seems to me that God's timing was precise at that moment, and it wasn't a coincidence at all. God was opening up an opportunity for Simon to come to faith in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, Psalm 37, verse 23, it says, the steps of a good man are ordered or directed by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Now, concerning this particular scripture, one commentator wrote, the idea is all that pertains to the journey of a good man through his life is directed, ordered, fitted, or arranged by the Lord. His course of life is under God's divine guidance and control. So what seemed to be at first a humi humiliating inconvenience is actually going to have less results. Simon carried the cross with Jesus, and, and in doing so, he came to faith in Christ. Not only did he come to faith, but his wife, and as I mentioned, his sons also came to faith in Jesus Christ. This kind of thing has been called a divine appointment. Like when Jesus was going to Galilee, but John 4 verse 4 says that he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria because there was a woman who was there at a well. He had a divine appointment with this woman at the well. In that conversation, he was able to bring her to faith in himself. You remember the story how that Jesus had said that, I need to go through this area. And he went and he was there by this well, the well of Sychar. And while he was there, his men went off to find something to eat. And this woman came at noon carrying a pot, a jug, so that she could draw water at noon. And if you know anything about the culture of that day, the women would draw water. They would draw water in the morning when it was cool or in the late afternoon when it was cool. But they wouldn't do so during the middle of the day because it was too hot. And so she had come there at noon, which tells us something about the woman. It tells us that she was shunned by the women of the city because the women would gather together. It was kind of the place that they would gather to visit with one another as they were drawing water, but she wasn't welcome to that. She had to come at a different time, and a time when it was difficult, in a time when it was dry, in a time when it was, it was more, like she was alone. And, but Jesus, the Bible said, he had an appointment with her. I need to go to Samaria. The Jews normally would not go through Samaria. Well, what they would do is they would go around Samaria. If you were looking at a map of Israel, it's like a map of California. You have Northern California, Southern California. Well, Central California, well, in the map for Israel, that's Samaria. So the Jews would normally go across the Jordan River to the east, and they would pass by, go past it, and then come back to the west to go to Jerusalem. Jesus needed to go through there. Why? Because he had an appointment with a woman at a well. Normally, he would have just passed by. This time, he went straight in. And as he does so, he has a conversation with this woman. He begins to speak to her. And as he does so, he begins by saying to her, give me a drink of water. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask of me, a woman of Samaria, to give you a drink? And John tells us, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. If you knew who it is who is speaking to you and was asking service from you, give me a drink, you would have asked me for a living water. We all know that conversation. How are you going to give me any water? You don't have anything to draw the water with. And Jesus begins to speak. And as he does so, she says to him, she says to him, 
um, that she's interested in what his conversation is. And he says, well, go get your husband. She says, I have no husband. And in this, Jesus said, this, this is true. You've had five. And the one that you're living with right now isn't your husband. I perceive you're a prophet. And they have that conversation where Jesus brings her to faith in himself. And this woman goes and speaks to the only ones who would listen to her, the men, and draws them back to speak to Jesus. Is this the one? And Jesus has an opportunity not only to lead some woman to, to himself in faith, but also has the opportunity to proclaim the kingdom to people who would normally not be interested in or have opportunity to hear. God uses divine, what we call divine coincidences, but they're really appointments. And he had an appointment with Simon, even though Simon did not know. Simon is coming out of the country. He's been lodging outside of it. It's too many people in the city. He gets up early, begins to walk as he's walking. He encounters this man, a prisoner, who's there by the gate, more than likely the Damascus gate. The Romans constrain him to pick up this cross. It's a divine appointment, but he sees it at first as an inconvenience. But in doing so, these moments that just piece together so well shows us God's ability to direct the footsteps of those he's calling. And I've told John this more than once, that your life can change in a second, in a split second. My brother got saved. I lived in Norwalk. My ugly brother lived here in Ontario. <laughs> he wasn't being discipled. So I told my sister Madeline, I want to give Frank a Bible study in 1974. I came to teach my brother through the Gospel of Mark. He began inviting friends. And one day, a young woman walks in the door. I didn't know her. And then one second later, I was introduced to her. Dave, he said, this is Marie. One second. One second. One second, I didn't know her. And since 1974, I've been with her. One second. And the Lord uses divine appointments in our lives where we don't know his leading, but he's directing us. What we consider inconveniences, humiliations, maybe things, I don't want to do that. Why are you doing that? How come you're doing that? Because the Lord is weaving things in our life to give us opportunity. And that's what he did with, with the woman at the well. She didn't know him. He introduced himself. She followed him and also brought others to hear him. Simon is on his way. Goes to, just passing by the Damascus gate. There's a man. He's carrying a cross. He's looking at him. And before you know it, he's constrained to carry that cross with this man. And in doing so, comes the faith which, for, in Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus arrived at Calvary, he was brutally nailed to a cross. As we saw, he was offered a mild narcotic. He refused to drink it. It would have dulled his senses from the full experience, so he wouldn't drink. He was crucified at 9 a.m., and the soldiers had finished part of their task. Matthew 27, 36 gives us more information than Mark. In Matthew 27, 36, Matthew wrote, sitting down, speaking of the soldiers, they kept watch over him there. They kept watch over him. Why would they do that? Well, they watched to keep him from being taken down and rescued. Now, that's one more piece of evidence that proves the reality of his death. Now, the person being crucified would normally have the charges written out. It would be written on a tablet placed above his head. And in, in, in this case, Mark says, the king of the Jews. John 19, verses 20 through 22 says it like this. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. And that's when Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And so that's where we left off last time. Now we can begin at verse 27. 
It says, with him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right hand, or on his right, and the other on his left. Now Mark informs us that Jesus did not die alone. He died between two men, and he's describing these men as robbers. Now the word robber speaks of a violent man, someone who's capable of murder. Commentators will point out that these two were more than likely part of a group of men that were following after the man Barabbas, the one that the crowd had decided they wanted over Jesus Christ. As we looked at that, Luke 23, 19 tells us that Barabbas was guilty of rebellion and murder. Now, Barabbas was considered a hero for his fight against the government. You see, people have a tendency of celebrating that kind of man. And these men more than likely had been arrested with him. That would explain why Jesus was mocked, but these men weren't because the world appreciates men like those men who are dying on the cross, but not men like Jesus Christ. They were regarded as freedom fighters. They were men who were fighting for justice. That sounds familiar to me in our day. Well, the Bible says in verse 28, those uh, rather, so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. This scripture that it speaks of is once again a, 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 a portion of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 12. Again, there are somewhere around 300 scriptures that are fulfilled, a little bit more, some would say, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ or Messiah. This is one of those scriptures. You see, Jesus, when it was Passover and he was at the meal, had quoted this verse and applied it to himself. Luke 22, 37 uh, says, it is written, he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus speaking, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. So Jesus knew Isaiah 53, 12 applied to him. And the Bible says that he was numbered. When the word numbered is used, and it says he was numbered with the transgressors, the word transgressors speaks of those who revolt, those who are rebels. He was numbered with the transgressors. He was numbered with the rebels, those who revolt. The word numbered means he was considered, judged, supposed, or account, accounted as a transgressor. Numbered speaks, of, numbered speaks of the reality. It speaks of facts and not suppositions. In other words, they totally considered Jesus a transgressor among other transgressors. In their mind, he was a sinner. He was a sinner in the midst of other sinners. That's what Isaiah 53, 12 is saying, that the people thought of Messiah. So he was numbered with the transgressors. He was accounted as being a complete rebel. He was a one who revolted. He was somebody who was sinful. That's how they looked at him. But that didn't bother him because he had made a habit of being around sinners. When he was numbered with them, that isn't something he had a problem with because that was one of the things that he had come to do is to reach people. His enemies didn't like that. But Jesus knew who he had come to save. In, Je in Luke 7, 34, it says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking. You say, here's a glutton and a drunkard. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus had a habit of spending time with sinners. In Matthew 9, 10 through 13, it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Why does your, why does your master eat with them? In the Jewish economy, in the Jewish culture, to sit down and to share a meal with somebody was much more than simply sharing a meal. It had something to do with your, your being, having things in common. You know, you go, you'll probably go out and many of you will go out and grab something to eat after church. Some of you will go to a Mexican restaurant. As I look out there, probably a lot of you will go <laughs> to a Mex Mexican restaurant. I've said this before, I'll say it quickly, but it kind of illustrates this. You're at the table, they bring the, the, the salsa and they bring the, the chips and all. And with those, that circle of friend, friends you have at the table, you'll dip and you'll eat. My wife always says, don't double dip. But 
you'll dip and you'll eat. And that's what you do. But you don't go to the table next to you unless you know them very well. If they're strangers, you wouldn't go up, excuse me, we don't have any salsa and pour some of theirs and yours and come back, right? Well, why don't you do that? Well, we say it's impolite. No, it's not. It's because we are very, very aware of who we share a dish with. We're very aware of that. We only share those things with people we have something in common with, normally. So when the, the Jews saw Jesus eating with these sinners, naturally they would say he has something in common with them. And they had a problem. Not only did they have a problem with it, but they went to the disciples and asked, why does he do that? It's because Jesus is a friend of sinners. He was then, and guess what? He still is. Because if he didn't care about us, we wouldn't be saved but he does care about it. So when Jesus entered into Jericho, he had gone to a home of a man named Zacchaeus for supper. And when he did that, many complained. They had said, he's gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. But Jesus gave the reason why he entered his house in Luke 19, verse 10. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I wonder if that applies to any of us today. Has he come to seek and save us? Did he seek and save me? Yes. If you're unsaved, he's seeking to save you. See, the Bible says, by nature, all men are sinners. Every one of us break the laws of God every day. That's because it's, it's kind of a natural thing. Ephesians 2, 3 tells us that we are by nature children of wrath. In Psalm 51, verse 5, the psalmist said, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So by his death, he ransomed us. He purchases us with his own blood. And that's the way God is going to provide salvation for men. In John 10, 14, and 15, Jesus said it like this. He said, I'm the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, the apostle said, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We're going to see that in action in just a moment. Now Luke's timeline of these events records that Jesus prayed after being crucified. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus, as high priest, is making intercession on their behalf. And he's doing this amid the cruelty and mockery of the soldiers and the rulers. Though in excruciating pain, he's praying for those who harmed him. And in pain, he's surrounded by heartless and evil people. And even so, he prayed. He wasn't necessarily praying for Judas, the priest, or even Pilate. They all had different amounts of information concerning him. He was praying for the soldiers who were carrying out their duties. He was praying for the men who were dying next to him. He was praying for those who were watching him as he died. He could have asked for justice. He could have asked for retribution. But instead, he prays for mercy. He didn't absolve them of sin, but he made it possible for them to be forgiven. One commentator said the dying Christ prayed for his enemies the glorified Christ lives to make intercession for us. In verse 29, it says, Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. He's crucified outside of the city gates. It's a place that's filled with foot traffic. People are passing by. They did that on purpose so that it would be a warning and as they pass by, they begin to mock him even as he's dying. When it says in verse 29, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, those are the false charges that had been leveled at him, and now they've spread. The lies have been repeated until they're considered facts. You who claim to have such power, you're not so much, you're not so powerful now, are you? Save yourself, verse 30. Come down from the cross. Well, again, this mocking fulfilled prophecy concerning how he was treated. In Psalm 22, verses 6 through 8, the psalmist writes, But I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men, 
and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. I want you to note that the Messiah in Psalm 22 is presented as a worm. He says, I am a worm and no man. Now, the Hebrew word for that, for the word worms, speaks of a particular worm. It's called the scarlet worm. And the word worm speaks of crimson or scarlet. Henry Morris, in the book Biblical Basis for Modern Science, wrote, when the female of the scarlet worm species was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she would never leave again. The eggs deposited beneath her body were in this manner protected until the larvae were hatched and able to enter their own life cycle. As a mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body and the surrounding wood. From the dead bodies of such female scarlet worms, the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted. And he went on to write, what a picture this gives of Christ dying on a tree, shedding his precious blood, that he might bring many sons unto glory. He died for us that we might live through him. Now as this is taking place, verse 31 Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now, not only are those passing by mocking him, but so are the chief priests. And these are the most wicked because they knew better, yet they still did this to him. The priests were those who led worship services. The priests were the ones who served God and man. They offered sacrifices for the people, spiritually cared for them. They taught people about God. In Leviticus 10, 11, it says that you, speaking to priests, that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. They had the responsibility of teaching people how to worship God, how to love their neighbor as themselves, how to love God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. They, the, they were the ones who would give the answer to the spiritual questions. They were the people that, that the Jewish uh, people around would see the priests, and they respected them. They regarded them. They were the, the ones who led them in a spiritual way, and, and yet here they are showing them how to mock a man dying on a cross. They said in verse 32, let the Christ descend from the cross and we may see and believe. Now once again, descend from the cross is a re repetition of the fact that they often ask Jesus to, to do a sign, show us a sign. In Matthew 12, 38 and 39, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, the one who was in that great fish three days, three nights. But they're saying, Let the, the Christ descend from the cross that we may see and believe. If you are really Christ, if you're Israel's king, come down that we may see. If you are Messiah, show us your power. Descend from the cross. Well, obviously, he wouldn't do that. He came to earth with a purpose, and his purpose was to give, give up his life. In Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's an, anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. In 1 John 3, verse 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of of the devil. Jesus would not descend from the cross because he had come to die on that cross. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve, to give his life, he said, as a ransom for many. He came to voluntarily redeem sinful man. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 6 simply says, speaking of Jesus, 
who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. In John 10, 17 and 18, for this reason the Father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. I won't come off this cross because I came for this cross. Now notice verse 32. Those who were crucified with him reviled him. At first the two thieves join in with the others who are mocking him. But eventually one of them begins to have second thoughts. He had heard Jesus pray. He heard Jesus as he's saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that just began to settle on him undoubtedly. Jesus was experiencing mind-numbing pain. And yet he's praying for those who are around him. And it may have caused him to see something. It might have caused him or provoked him to see that God is willing to forgive. Because the Bible teaches that it's God's desire to forgive and not to condemn. Ezekiel 18.32, God says, I, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. Repent and live. In John 3.17, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why he came. And this thief there on the cross, here's Jesus, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's looking at this bloodied man. Portions of his beard have been pulled out. His back is still raw and torn open by the scourging. He's dying just like this, these other two are. And yet he's praying. This has been going on for around three hours. One of the thieves gets angry, begins to lash out at him. In Luke 23, 39, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. One thief has no fear of God, no sorrow, no repentance for his evil. He wouldn't confess that he deserved punishment. He had no desire to repent. He said, save yourself and us. But there's another thief, and he reveals a different reaction. Luke tells us in Luke 23, 40 and 41, but the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. He has conviction, and there's fear of the coming judgment. See, this man was on a cross. He had done wrong. He was with Barabbas, and Luke had told us that Barabbas was guilty of not only insurrection, but also of murder. So this person, who is more than likely one of the men who followed after him, was also guilty of those things. That's why he would be dying. And so this is a guy who's killed somebody, maybe more, we don't know. But as he does so, he's saying, don't you fear God? We, we indeed are justly dying. We've done wrong. This man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The thief was touched because it's never too late. God's plan of salvation unfolds while he's hanging on that cross. He recognized his sin and his coming judgment. That's why he would say, do you not fear God? The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. The Bible also says in Hebrews 10, 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, according to one commentator, wisdom comes from understanding the holy and righteous nature of God. Without this knowledge, we can't truly reverence him. In Luke 12, verse 5, Jesus said, I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after you've been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Do you not fear God? 
This thief who's on that cross has seen what's taking place over this time. He's heard Christ pray. And he's recognized that Jesus is innocent and that he is guilty. He had said, we justly, we receive the due reward of our deeds. He's aware of his sin. He's confessed that he's sinful. Romans 3.10 says, there's none righteous, no, not one. And then he says in verse 42, Lord, recognize, he calls him Lord, recognizing who Jesus is. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. And so as these things are going on in his mind, he prays. And you know what he prays? Well, he had heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's basically saying, Lord, remember me. Lord, would you please apply that prayer to me? Remember me. He's saying, I've become one of your followers. I've come to trust you. Even as Simon, who carried the cross, came, this thief who was on a cross also came. Lord, don't forget me. Remember me. Remember me as the one who once hung by your side. Never let me escape your awareness is what remember means. Lord Jesus, and this is very touching when you consider it, Lord Jesus, remember me forever. Not just this moment. Not just this time of suffering and pain. Not just this time of, of me dying next to you for things I did. Remember me. Remember me as somebody who came to you. Y you had said, Father, forgive them. Would you please include me in that? Would you please forgive me? I'm guilty. I did this. I should be on this cross, but you aren't. I'm a sinner, but you're innocent. Remember me. The word remember speaks more of simply recollecting in your mind events and things that transpired in the past. It also carries with it a connotation of remembering and acting. I remember, thus I do. When we take of communion, we remember him. We take and we do. We think of what he has done in the past. We think of what he's doing now and we look forward to what he'll do in the future. But it all begins by remembering him. That's why Jesus, when he was initiating communion, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember me. While well, we have a thief on a cross who's looking at Jesus and he's saying, remember me. Never forget me. And Jesus is saying, today you will be with me in paradise. I promise you, I will never forget you. In the book of Isaiah 49, verse 15, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. Though she, a mother, which in Scripture is very often the most tender picture of one who loves a mother, can she forget her nursing baby? Can't you forget those times and those moments that she held that child, nursed that child, loved that child, sung to that child, kissed that baby and held that baby? Can't she forget? Yes, she can. But I'll never forget you. You see, paradise was used as a way of speaking of a private garden. The king would invite his favorite subjects into this garden as a special privilege and for fellowship. It came to speak of eternal blessedness. It was used to describe heaven. And so he's saying, I won't forget you because today 
You will be with me in paradise. I'll never forget you. You're going to close your eyes here, but you'll be with me forever. No, I'll never forget you. And he won't forget you either. Keep that in mind. He thinks of you, and he loves you. What an amazing thought. You see, had Jesus remained, amen, had Jesus remained in the grave, his promise would have been a lie. But Romans 1 verse 4 says he was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He said, I'll never forget you. And for you, if you've come to faith in Christ, he'll never forget you either. He loves you. He died on that cross for you. And in a way, when he was saying, Father, forgive them, that could somehow apply in future tense to, the, to us, those of us who have come to faith in him because in Christ, because his blood was poured out for us and we have come to faith in Christ, we have been forgiven of our sins. How many of them? All of them. All of them. Every single sin has been washed clean by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for the work you've done for us. Amen. And Father, we ask that we might remember you even as you remember us. In a busy world that is so caught up with a variety of things that make distractions in our life seem more important than even you, I would ask that we would learn to settle our attention, to fix our attention on you, that we would be settled in our conviction of who you are, and that we would rejoice in and, and, Lord, glory in the reality that you are the one who forgives us of our sins. So we bless you and we thank you, Lord. And even as we look at this, this man on the cross next to you, we realize we could be one or the other. We could be one who is saying, remove me so I can go on with my sinful life. Or we can be the other who says, Lord, remember me. I just ask, Lord, that we would know that for those who are watching online, those who are outside, those of us who are in this room, that we would realize that even now. We can be forgiven, and we are when we ask. And even as your eyes are closed and heads are bowed, perhaps the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you, and it's time for you to get right with the Lord. Maybe you're like this thief that was on that cross next to Jesus. And the Spirit of God is saying to you, you need to get right with Him. You can do that today. And I feel led of the Lord today to give an open invitation for any who are here right now. We need to get right with God. And this is what we're going to do. I'm going to have us all stand in a moment. And if you know the Holy Spirit is drawing you, that you need to get right with God, then I'm going to ask you to step up from where you are and to come and stand in front of this platform and openly confess Christ as your Lord and Savior and ask for forgiveness in, in a humbling way before God and man. Our worship team will lead you in song. We'll be singing as you come forward, should you choose to. We'll pray together. One of our follow-up ministers will spend a moment with you after service, and today you will get right with God. You may be backslidden, and you know it's time to get right with Him. You may be somebody who's never asked Christ to forgive you of your sins. And today will be the first time you say, God, be merciful to me. Remember me. Whatever the case may be, I'm going to ask you in a moment as we stand and we begin to sing, to slip out from where you are and to walk up and stand quietly here in the front until the song concludes and we'll pray together. If you're nervous to come by yourself, perhaps someone next to you will come with you. But if you know the Spirit is drawing you, don't quench him. Obey him and come and stand up here. Father, we ask that you would draw people to yourself for your glory. Draw them to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about getting right with him and you need to come forward, please do so as we sing. Lord, I come.
Father, as we stand up here right now, just opening ourselves to you, we give you praise and honor and glory for your Holy Spirit is the one who draws us. And Lord, it's by your word and and your spirit that you create in us life. Your spirit draws us and then dwells in us. And thank you, Lord, for speaking to these who are here right now. We're standing here saying yes to you. As our eyes remain closed for another moment, perhaps there are others here that uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to you and you didn't move. Uh, Whenever I give an invitation, I always want to wait a little bit longer in case somebody is just wrestling right now. So if there's anybody else, anybody else in this room that, or maybe even outside that the Lord is speaking to right now and you say, I should be up there and the song's over, I can't. No, you can't. We'll wait for you. Is there anybody else that the Holy Spirit is speaking to right now who's saying, I ought to be up there. I need to get right with God. Is there anybody else? And if there is, we'll wait for you. Come on up and stand up here. Come on up. Give your heart to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else? Is there anybody? I don't want to close without you. Anybody else that the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to? Anybody? There we go. Praise the Lord. Amen. Isn't God good? He's, he rescues us. I mean, he, He's patient. So are we. Amen. Yes, amen. Now, you guys, you can turn around and look at me. <laughs> Welcome to God's family.
Welcome. Amen. Welcome. Let's pray together. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a simple prayer. I'm going to ask you to repeat with me the prayer. When you do so, you're opening your heart to Christ. And as you give your, your life to him, he's going to change you. God's going to do a work in you. Now, Sam, are you going to be the follow-up minister? Off to, to my left, your right, is a brother named Sam. He's here to spend just a moment with you. I'll ask that you go with him. But let's pray together. Please repeat after me. Father, I know that I am a sinner. Jesus died on the cross to save sinners. Jesus died to save me. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Make me new. I will follow you every day from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Could you go right here? Off that way? Just right there? You know, guys, sometimes, and we'll close with a song and a prayer, but sometimes you don't realize what the Lord can do. You know, think of your, your, when you came to Christ. I don't know how old you were. I was 20, you know, and, and I came to faith in Christ at the age of 20. And look what God has done in these years. God does things. God transforms you. God changes you. I've had men in this church, you know him. For example, uh, Dave Trujillo. Dave was, I forget, 19 or so, and he had come here uh, because one of, uh, one of his friends had challenged him because David said, well, that pastor, pastors are stupid. And so his friend said, well, you, th you think so? Why don't you go and listen to him, then tell him after, after church? And so Dave did, and Dave was a gangster. He brought a van load of his little gang, and they came. And I have a picture of Dave with, with me when he was still all choloed out. And he, uh, he, he, he came and he said, you know what happened when you, when you were sharing about what Jesus went through for me? He says, it broke me. And now he pastors a church in South L.A. We've seen God do, I, could, I can tell you stories, but when I see people and I see these people up here and this young fellow over here, you know, I was that young fellow. Maybe some of you were. I was that one nobody trusted. I was the thief. I was the liar. I was the sinner. I was the doper. I was the drunk. That's what I was. Well, what am I now? I'm a man of God because God transforms life. We need to understand that. God does that. And so I, I tear up because who knows what the Lord's going to do in these people's lives from this moment. And we had a chance to see when it began. And Father, we bless you for that. I ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would work within us. Lord, we too are that thief on that cross but you give new life. You never forget us, and we love you for it. As we leave this place, may we keep that in mind. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
changes everything I was blind, now I see Your grace changes everything By the cross, I am free Your grace changes everything lead us and bless this week. If you need prayer for any reason, for anything right now, come on up front. Men and women leaders are going to be up here to pray with you and pray over you right now. Church, have an awesome week. We love you guys.